What's up everyone, this is Donnie aka Elevated with Dota Alchemy and this video is going to be a bit of a rehash. It's going to be sort of like a clip compilation of some of the best pieces of content that we've made in the past. We know that we put out so much that it can be kind of hard to keep track of all the things that we've covered and hopefully that this format can give you a little bit more high value information without having to sift through our entire library. So I hope you enjoy this quick chop up. Always try hard, even in games with intentional feeders. The Dota 2 matchmaker works in mysterious ways. Nobody really knows exactly how it works, but what's not mysterious is that matchmaking will naturally push you toward a 50% win rate. With that being said, your aim should not be to win 100% of your games or anywhere near that. The reality is that if somebody could do that, they would have already won the international multiple times. What it's all about is aiming for a slightly above 50% win rate. For simplicity's sake, let's just say you should aim for 51% win rate, because then, over time, your rank is obviously going to increase. But where does that extra 1% usually come from? That 1% typically comes from those games that seem unwinnable, where most people would just give up. So even if you have someone experiencing Dota insanity on your team, perhaps a courier feeder or somebody who's griefing you, it's absolutely in your best interest to keep trying, because if you win that, that's plus one victory that should have been a loss. Would you say the value of a carry at the end of the game is only defined on how much damage they do, or are there other factors besides hero damage that are important? God, no. God, no. Carry da is like... <laughs> yeah. Damage is like... Carry's one of the l less... Like, carry should arguably have the least damage. Maybe only the five roll should be below them, because the carry should only really be doing damage on super specific timings. Like, that. that's the problem with carry and judging it based on damage, is that it's not a damage-dealing role, like... You should be pushing waves. That's that's one of your goals. You should be getting objectives like your tower damage, also your your CS, the amount of farm that you've been able to get. The the uh, I would say like one of the best metrics for carry is how little you've died. Yeah. Like over any other rule, like a carry should have you know up to, like zero to zero to five deaths in a long game, ideally. The most important thing to do while split pushing is getting the creep wave into the enemy tower. A lot of people think it's to get farm, it's to pressure the tower and actually hit the tower with your hero. It is absolutely none of those things. The most important thing to do while split pushing is to simply get the creep wave pushing in the enemy team's direction in the safest way possible. You want to stay alive, which means playing around, around vision is really important. So you, you, want, you want to stay alive, but also if you are in a situation where you don't have vision, you can still do a really good job split pushing just by using a nuke on the creep creeps like instantaneously backing off and not going for any of the last hits and just allowing the creep wave to push into the enemy tower and speaking of vision one of the most important things about split pushing is that pushing the creeps into the enemy tower will force somebody to go defend that tower giving you vision of them making it safe for you to farm a larger area of the map so basically the most important thing in my opinion when it comes to, to, to split pushing is understanding that your only job is to get that creep wave to their tower for the purpose of you having a larger area of the map it's not even about the tower it's literally just about the creeps being at the tower and having the enemy team have to deal with it Job done. Already done. Yeah. You're already pushing this lane. If you are jungling this camp right here, let's say your skeletons miss every single last hit. They're a bunch of fucking morons. They miss every single last hit on these creeps. You get incredibly unlucky. You farm this camp, it's still the exact same amount of gold as this, except not yeah. dangerous. And you're denying them this camp to farm, and you're not being extremely unsafe. So the whole point of pushing out lanes as a carry is not to farm, it's so that you're not completely useless while you're farming. This right here is, is is like a misunderstanding of the purpose of pushing lanes. It's to get the yeah. enemy team to respond. But then the moment you sit there with your hero, that's displaying a misunderstanding of the purpose of hitting creep. You are in position and you spawn skeletons pushing the lane. That is what Hector would do. Hector would yeah. not sit there and hit the creep wave because it is redundant. It is for farm where you can get the literal exact same amount of farm, if not more, in their jungle while also denying them this jungle farm. So you've already forced them back. Like that was good. Just cut the second part out where you hit with your hero. Totally unnecessary. How do you deal with the fed mid when you're safe lane carry, Nusham? Let's go. Uh, 
your safe lane carry. I would say the really good safe lane carries, they know how to gauge if like they can go to the enemy jungle. And they'll try to get vision in the enemy jungle and play there instead and cut waves. Uh, it depends on what point in the game you're talking about. If it's like in the early mid game, like eight minute mark, then chances are you're just going to be going to the offlane. It's a little awkward if the tower's not dead, but you're going to be trying to get that tower, like, you know, cutting waves, pulling to camps, just farming the wave in front of your tower, stuff like that. But if it's in like the mid game, usually you just try to push waves as like carefully as possible and just get to the enemy jungle. Like you want to get to the spots they're not playing in. The best part about playing in the enemy jungle too is like if they do come bring like say three heroes to kill you, they're teeping away from your side of the map to their side of the map. So now they're losing a lot of pressure on your side of the map. So chances are, you know, your support can now go walk in and deward your jungle. They can go get wards and you can maybe start playing there soon. So in Dota, you can break the map down into four quadrants when it comes to farming. You have your triangle, your jungle, their jungle, their triangle. Typically, in a winning game, you might occupy three of these quadrants if you're lucky, and you'll be farming three of these quadrants if you're lucky, maybe two in an even game or in a slightly winning game, and one, which is usually going to be your triangle in a losing game. The safest place on the map to farm is the triangle, the second safest is your jungle, the third safest is their jungle, least safe place to farm on the map is their triangle. The order of which it benefits you to farm these places is the opposite. It's most beneficial to farm their triangle, it's second most beneficial to farm their jungle, and so forth. And the reason for that is because if you farm your triangle and you are using heroes and wards to secure your tri triangle, chances are, because of how distance these towers are away from each other and how far out this bottom jungle is here, you are not going to have access to your jungle. So if you are working on securing your triangle, you're going to be stuck in your triangle. Uh, likewise, if you take the enemy's triangle, then chances are they are not feeling safe enough to go into their jungle anyway. So farming their triangle is the best place on the map to farm, but the most dangerous. So this is a really important note that he's not showing on this top lane. He's not farming the top lane. He's letting fly take this lane, and instead, Sumail is taking the jungle. So the reason that he's in this jungle is because Terrorblade is farming the triangle and getting some catch-up farm. Anyway, Arteezy right. is farming over here in the triangle, so Sumail wants to kind of mirror his movements on the opposite side of the map because Sumail is the space creator right now. He's the ganker. In fact, if you could look up and see past all of the voice lines and taunts that OG has done, they actually have been saying, Sumail is missing, Sumail is missing, Lashrak is missing. Uh, and the reason for that is because he's not showing. So this is exactly why he's jungling next to this area instead of just appearing up in that lane because he's keeping OG on their toes. He's making space for his team by not showing. Uh, and so he does this for quite some time. I think that if this is a pub, you probably just angle to take this tower after killing somebody, especially the PA. But basically, when it comes down to actions in Dota and whether they're good or bad, what you want to do is just kind of treat everything as a data point towards making decisions. If your teammates do something really stupid, really bad, you're giving the other team an advantage, just treat that as a data point. Okay, now something bad has happened. Now the momentum has shifted towards the other team, and I need to incorporate the fact that the momentum is now on the other team into the way that I'm itemizing, playing, making calls, etc. There's a lot of ways that you can take it, but what the, the number one thing that I would recommend basically in this scenario, if they absolutely will not listen to you and they won't communicate to you either, is to try to just take the resources that are available to you in the game. That is, if you have a silencer that has global silence and he is not allowing you to use his ultimate as a resource, he's not listening to you, when you say, I'm going to go in and then use global, you need to play around that just not being an available resource, or you need to play around how you think he's going to use the spell given that he's not communicating maybe he needs to get gone or maybe you need to bait him maybe you need to wait until a big fight starts and not really go for those small pickoffs uh, expecting a global a global silence uh, that that's one thing that i've realized in the past few weeks uh playing competitive again is that different players and different teams will give you a different amount of resources on the map um and that obviously goes for your teammates as well there's a certain amount of stuff that you can do with a certain amount of people and the best players will take everything that they can within reason. If you are not versatile within the patch, you're only picking three or four heroes that seem to be strong, that you're good with, that you're having success with in the patch, that's actually a really good way to learn stuff because the more reps you have, the better you are at them. 
Whereas if every single patch you're just playing like 40 different heroes throughout the course of that, you know, couple weeks or month or however long the patch lasts, then you kind of don't even get all of the nuance of playing those heroes. You're basically just kind of doing what you've always been doing, which is just to have like a mediocre level of understanding of all of the heroes in the game, which is really not that conducive to becoming a high level player since you need to really kind of advance your play and become really, really good at some heroes to be able to carry higher level games.